Um, before I start the presentation, I'd, I'd just like to make a few comments. <clears throat> One is, um, I've seen a lot of international cooperation process. I've been involved in APEC Energy Working Group and, and a variety of other things like that. What's going on here with this Nordic-Baltic cooperation is, is, I think, really, really good. Um, and so I want to commend you for this. Um, I think you've, you've got um, a natural grouping of countries that, by geography, but also by attitude or mindset, should be working together, and, and I think you're working together very well. And um, I think, you know, you're playing to your strengths, and um, I, what I've heard yesterday I, I can think only of good things coming from this. And so um, I just want to encourage you, keep pushing this, because I think it's a very good collaboration that you have. So uh, well done. Um, second thing, a little plug for the World Energy Outlook. Um, we're currently um, finalising that. In fact, it must be off at the printers uh, soon, because it'll be released in about three and, a, three and a half weeks' time in London on the 12th of November. There are four chapters in energy efficiency this year. Um, so every, every year, we owe the World Energy Outlook picks a particular fuel to focus on it. This year, we're focused on energy efficiency. Um, and um, we've had a little bit of a role in, in drafting this. Um, I think it's going to you know, re-establish a call to look more seriously at energy efficiency and treat it as, as another fuel, as we might gas, for instance. So um, look out for that. Um, as a little bit of context for my presentation, we, we are completing a small study that we've undertaken in our unit looking at um, the amount of financing, climate financing around the world that's actually getting to energy efficiency projects. And we're finding it's quite a small amount of the funding. So a lot of the climate funding is going to uh, quite worthwhile climate um, uh, greenhouse gas reducing projects but it's not actually um, getting, a lot of it's getting to energy efficiency projects, which is a rather strange situation. And so we're, we're finding that quite an interesting little piece of, of, um, of context. And so um, think about that as we go into this presentation. So um, we know that energy efficiency has, is one of the largest contributors to addressing climate change um, and, and uh, achieving the emission reductions we need to achieve. Um, so the graph I put up yesterday was a global one. Today it's just the European Union scale. But again, we see that energy efficiency is um, the single largest contribution. In the short term, it could be two-thirds of the change that we need to achieve. And in the longer term, it's still around about half. Um, and as we said yesterday, CCS, nuclear, uh, these, are, these are tricky. It's hard to bet on these with some certainty of the outcomes. Um, and we know that renewables and biofuels are making good progress. But our, our focus here is energy efficiency and its contribution to climate change. It should be big. Um, and I really want to focus on the relationship between energy efficiency and climate change policies. You'll all be familiar for the, with this sort of merit order graph. Um, they're called McKinsey curves nowadays, and I don't know why, because when I first came across them, we called them Vartenfell graphs, because there's one of these things that came out of the Nordic experience of Vartenfell with a deliberate focus on DSM. So I like to call it what it originally was called, but uh, th this is a powerful concept because we're, we're creating a merit order around the price of CO2 and the quantity of CO2 reduction we can get. And <clears throat> basically, carbon price helps mediate the action across an economy, across a system, or globally. Um, so you're, you're releasing chunks of CO2 mitigation capacity at different prices. You'll all be familiar with this. What we tend to find, though, is that this bottom left-hand corner, there's a lot of energy efficiency projects with a negative carbon price. They're more than paying for themselves. They're low-hanging fruit. They're the work that we should be doing anyway. And this is why it's particularly interesting to find that very little carbon finance is actually going to energy efficiency. It should be the first thing we're picking up, up because it contributes significantly to short-run progress on greenhouse gas emission reduction. Um, we know that some of these longer-term technologies take a bit of time before the price comes down, and, and the current analysis sort of does account for them at higher prices, but the prices will come down. The marginal abatement costs do come down over time. So we have an interesting relationship uh, here, and of course we're always trying to play this out over an economic um, challenge. We, we're trying to uh, ensure an economically efficient rolling out of the change. Um, 
here's the big thing, energy efficiency. This potential for energy efficiency can help us mitigate more emissions at a lower price. And that's, that's a, a powerful concept that we need to try to pursue. And I guess that's the fundamental linkage between energy efficiency and climate policies. Okay, none of us really work to a single target. Um, and climate is not the only motivation for energy efficiency. Yesterday you saw that beautiful flower with all the different coloured petals and all the multiple outcomes of energy efficiency. Today we put a little bit more structure around this. Um, internationally, I, I guess greenhouse gas is the only real driver for international cooperation on energy efficiency, on climate change mitigation measures. But there are a whole bunch of national benefits. At the end of the day, any parliament, any decision makers in a country are going to be looking at the net national impact of the policies they're putting in place. In any sector and for any individual, whether it's a business or a household, they're going to be looking at the direct benefits. So we're actually looking at multiple benefits here, multiple drivers, in fact, for making good progress. It's not just climate change, it's many things. And so we need to develop quite better analytical techniques for working out how a particular intervention, an energy efficiency or climate change intervention, might actually deliver multiple outcomes and multiple benefits. Now the first problem you face when you try to do that is there's actually a lack of evidence. There's a lack of good evaluation of the different policies and programs. And we're finding that right now. We're finding it's actually quite hard to do this work because there hasn't been enough analysis done of what actually worked, what actually were the outcomes of a lot of the policies that have been put in place. But there are clearly multiple social opportunities, multiple economic opportunities here. Um, some of our work on the, the interaction between climate change and economic, um, sorry, energy efficiency policies, we did some work recently reviewing emissions trading systems. For many countries, these are a fundamental policy driver. Um, in fact, we have some countries saying to us, well, we have a, a, an emissions trading scheme now. What place is there for energy efficiency policies? And the simple response is, well, look, these are complementary measures. You can't just simply apply this tax and expect all these good things to happen without some stimulation of energy efficiency measures and other measures as well. So these two need to work together. Um, there's not a single policy that's going to deal with something as complex as what we're dealing with here. Um, some work on energy efficiency policy and carbon pricing. So how, how do pricing signals, economic instruments work together? Some work on the interactions of policies between renewable energy and climate. And finally, what we called summing up the parts, which was how the different policy instruments um, can work together to develop least cost mitigation strategies. So there's four booklets here. Um, they're on the IEA's website, and I think they give you the, the, the nitty gritty, the, the detail of how some of these things can work together. Um, I can refer you to the website, that's, that's probably the easiest place to get them, they're free to download. So, um, complementary measures. Uh, at one level you could say if energy efficiency is such a large contribution to climate change mitigation, which is the complementary measure and which is the leading policy? Well, it, it's not my place to tell countries what to do, you simply need to look at the two of them. I think what makes sense though is for you to take an overall socio-economic perspective here. You know, you have to deliver social and economic outcomes as you develop these policies. And I think that's important to keep that in mind. Um, we're serving multiple drivers and multiple outcomes. And I guess the art is to have a portfolio approach that means we're maximising the returns on the investments we're making and we're maximising the social and economic outcomes from these policies. Um, something that, that is Yes, everyone wants to know more about how do we deal with changing the minds of the people that make decisions, whether they're householders, business directors, or whether they're politicians or policy decision makers. How does behaviours, values uh, um, affect the outcomes we can achieve? And this is a little um, a slide from um, a project that was taken in Juneau, Alaska, when they had a, a significant transmission failure, and the 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 province there was literally put onto an emergency electricity management um, regime. Um, they lost 40% of their supply effectively. Um, and here's the range of things that people did in order to 
reduce the demand for electricity and to manage things. And you can see quite a variety of actions. Very few people did nothing. So clearly it wasn't too hard to motivate people to do something. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people simply started saying, OK, we know we need to use less electricity and, and put in place a most basic behavioural response. This suggests to us that there's a lot of scope to pursue this further. The behavioural aspects of this tend to be forgotten in the rush to developing roadmaps, doing a lot of analysis on things as fancy as hydrogen or things, that, things as basic as insulating old buildings. Um, we need to constantly work out how do we change mindsets. Um, there's a role for education, there's a role for um, publicity, for making people aware of the challenges, the things that they can do. Um, you saw this slide yesterday, slightly different format, but I still think, what is this about? It's about commitment and leadership. This forum, this grouping of Baltic and Nordic countries is committing and um, expressing leadership. And I think that's really important. Um, you clearly are looking at market-based principles as you go forward and ensuring you've got the right incentives. That's absolutely critical. Um, you're asking how does energy efficiency and renewable energy help with the priorities that you each, each have as individual countries but also as a collective of, of action. That's great. You're trying to work out how do you balance a portfolio. When I see you talking about you know, a, a, a joint investment in an LNG terminal for the region, that makes a lot of sense and it's, a, it's trying to get the balance right. You're balancing long and short term. Um, I don't know to what extent your energy end use data and your evaluation of work is, is really going to drive this, but I saw some good results, some hard numbers expressed yesterday, people going back to Innostat to get their numbers right. I think that's a good place to be. And finish what you start, it still goes back to 2008, not to the current context. We need to make sure we push these things through, and I think you have that commitment here to do that. So I think that's fabulous. It's great to see the action that's being taken here. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this t today we will not have a panel. So if you have questions to uh, Mr. Trom Tromop, uh, mm. you should ask now. I think it was very interesting to see and efficiency into the, uh, the wider perspective. And you pointed at uh, international level, national level, yep. local level, individual level. So you, you had the, the levels. Mm -hmm. um, any questions? I can see a hand there. Yeah, okay. I would be keen to know what implications on renewable energy, what we, we learned yesterday and heard many good presentations, what implication has the future emission trading scheme in Europe and maybe wider in the world up to, say, 2020, the third pe trading period, and beyond 2020? So, have, so have can I just clarify that? You're, you're saying what are the implications for an ETS uh, it is for wider development of renewable energy. So, so uh, is your question, as I, you roll out more renewable energy... Yeah, yeah. because up to now, um, those three Kyoto mechanisms were yeah. very good for wider development of RES. Yeah. And we know that countries like Baltic states, we had joint implementation, emission trading, yeah. no CDM. Yep. But what will be the future? Because that's a driving force that has been driving force yeah. up to now. Would it be going on in the future up to 2020 okay. and beyond of 2020? Yep. Um, I, I would have trouble picking the future of anything, including a game of cards, and even more trouble picking the future of, of, of ETSs. And I know there's a lot of concern, and perhaps particularly in environmental groups, that uh, say the ETS currently isn't working, the price is too low. But I would say also, if you see the progress that's being made in energy efficiency, renewables in particular, and the, this, the reductions in emissions that's happening, the, and, and the reduction in um, emissions that are coming from recessionary drivers, that price probably should be quite low right now. 
So uh, the future of it really depends on how much renewables we do actually get in place, um, how much defossilisation of power systems in particular and industrial systems we can achieve, how much energy efficiency we achieve, and how much other policies we put in place that actually increase the, the, the economic and social performance of our economies without emitting carbon. Um, they're a market mechanism. They, the, the prices will float as we deliver all these things. The long-term prospects, it would be a fabulous world if we didn't need an ETS. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Mardis uh, Lannister. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mardis Lannister from the Minister of Economic Affairs, Estonia. And uh, my question is about um, IEA's uh, view on transport sector and uh, there are several options to reduce uh, or uh, to decarbonize the uh, sector uh, and uh, what are IEA's view and uh, recommendations in this field, whether the government should put more emphasis on alternative fuels, biofuels, natural gas or is there more, more work to be done uh, with uh, energy efficiency in this sector? Um, okay, okay, it's a very simple answer to that, all of the above. Um, we've just published um, what we call a policy pathway, which is guidance to develop policies. Um, and, and the one we've just published is on fuel efficiency standards and labelling for motor vehicles. Um, we think that's absolutely essential. Um, we have in mind countries that don't have fuel efficiency standards yet. Uh, across Europe you do have something. Um, at one level we're thinking even of Saudi Arabia that are asking for, can you help us design fuel efficiency standards and labels for motor vehicles? Um, but, but most of the, the developing world doesn't have anything like that, and that's where the growth in vehicle populations will happen. So we need to do that. Um, we're also working on a policy pathway on public transport systems, and we have very much in mind Eastern Europe here where we have um, uh, cities. We're talking about cities here, not, not the countryside. Um, where they might have 50-year-old metro systems and bus systems, and um, we're looking at what are the policies for improving the efficiency of these systems, improving the service delivery that they provide, the mobility that they provide to citizens, but also um, reducing the emissions from, from the public transport system. So, yes, we need those efficient modes like um, trams, trains, buses, etc. The third thing is fuel switching. Um, a lot of work has been done around um, biofuels, etc. Yes, they're important. They're an important part of the mix. Um, but I suspect some of the biggest gains actually come from going to electric vehicles where you, know, you avoid the inefficiencies of a, a, a small internal combustion in a car with a lossy transmission drive cycle. Um, so going electric makes a lot of sense, particularly if you have something like a large hydro generator in your region. So um, we basically need to evolve all these modes. And I think the real challenge here is that when, when, we, when politicians and policymakers think of energy efficiency, they're thinking of stationary energy, buildings and industry. The, the, the level of maturity around transport energy efficiency policy is still quite low. And it's because ministries of transports pretty much work in their own space with a, their own strong agenda energy efficiency agencies work in their own space with their own agendas, and it, it, the, the two don't seem to really communicate or work together that well. It's the least mature area of energy efficiency. Um, you saw the slide I put up yesterday with the progress made in the, in the Nordic countries. Um, from 2009, there was virtually no real capability in transport energy efficiency across IEA member countries. 2011, there was a significant step forward but it was baby steps, it's still the first few steps. We're still to see a, a maturity of energy efficiency policies in that space. You need to do everything and you need to do more of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one more, one more question and then we have to, sure. uh, to finalize. I would like to ask a very general question. What do you think are the most um, the biggest problems associated with implementing energy efficiency? Yeah, okay. Um, you have the overview. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> for me, I think the biggest problem is that all around the world, in so many countries, so many people are trying to develop energy efficiency policies and programs. Um, we're not evaluating them well enough. 
and we're not learning fast enough, and we keep trying to do our own thing. Um, we're looking at doing some work in Saudi Arabia on, on appliance efficiency standards. I, I'm sorry, this has been done for years. Um, you look to Korea, the United States, Australia, um, and you have some of the world's most proficient appliance energy efficiency programs. The standards are all based on ISO and IEC standards procedures. There are international um, certification processes for the labs that do the testing. The major manufacturers are part of this process. You don't need to reinvent the wheel from square one. We know this works. Um, you simply need to say, okay, let's start picking up some of those international standards. So we're not learning fast enough and we're not evaluating well enough. I, I think they're the key problems. You know, that, that's If we did that better, I think we would have a much better chance of getting our senior politicians to understand what energy efficiency is and what it delivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also thank you for uh, commending the Nordic Baltic uh, Corporation. Oh, it's energy. very easy. <laughs> thank thank you. you very much.